Jonathan Chanzer is vice president of research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, talking a little bit about this news today. This is rare that we get this sort of statement from the president on quote unquote drone strikes, not using that exact term. What do you make of the statement, the timing of it, what he had to say? Well, uh, it is very rare. Obviously, the president didn't mention drone strikes per se. This is part of the parlance coming out of the White House. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we were aware of the fact that, that uh, Ahmed Farouk, uh, this uh, high value target, had, had been uh, struck back in January. It's interesting that it took this many months to get to the point where they were able to come out and, and perhaps confirm the fact that these hostages had been killed. Uh, I think there's probably going to be some uh, international fallout. You have a president that now needs to go to the prime minister of Italy to explain what happened. Uh, it's one thing to explain it to your own people here in the United States, but this is something of an international incident as well. I mentioned Adam Gadan in our intro. I did not mention Farouk. Why is Farouk important? Why was that an important figure? Sure. Farouk was the deputy emir uh, of al-Qaeda of the Indian subcontinent. This is one of the newer spin-offs, affiliate groups uh, of the al-Qaeda network. Uh, he was seen as one of the more up-and-coming leaders within the al-Qaeda network work. Uh, and interestingly, his name was, uh, it came up in the Abbottabad raid documents. So some of those documents, very few of them have been made public. More of them should be, but his name came out. It's interesting that you mentioned the raid because we were actually looking through some of the letters that were just released recently in court. And in some of these letters written to bin Laden, the drone strikes were mentioned by al Qaeda operatives. And here's what they had to say about it. Apparently the drone strikes were effective from their point of view, saying that we don't have any effective solutions to the espionage issue. Here's what else they had to say. Our current view of the situation, we need to reduce operations and activities, focus on preserving and survival, while we will be focusing on defensive security, counter espionage by focusing on striking the spy plane bases using special operations and on patience, persistence, hiding, as well as decreasing our presence. So that really tells you, as you look through these letters, they saw the planes, they were nervous about them, they weren't sure where they were going to strike, and apparently it was impacting their operations as well. Look, drone strikes are incredibly effective. Uh, they put the terrorists on the defensive. Uh, they, they strike fear into the hearts of these al-Qaeda operatives. And so uh, we know that they work. The problem is, is that sometimes you don't know what you're hitting. Uh, so in other words, they may have been able to identify that Farouk and Gadan were in these locations, uh, but they didn't know who else was there. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been picking up, my colleagues at the Long War Journal, Tom Jocelyn in particular, has been looking into the question of whether they're looking at algorithms. They're looking at, you know, uh, big data. Uh, uh, you know, giving indications that there could be senior operatives there without knowing everyone who is there. So less about human intelligence and more reliance on, on these algorithms, as you say. Excuse me, I can say it easy enough, <laughs> Jonathan. But is that, is that really what it is, that there's not the human intelligence on the well, ground? Well, you know, I, I'd like to think that there is human intelligence as well. But in other words, you don't know if, you, if you've been tracking this one safe house for the last month, you don't know who's been there for the last year. And that's how innocent lives can be, can be lost. We, previously, we're going to talk to you a little bit about terror financing because you testified yesterday uh, about this issue of terror financing. And we can bring it together with this topic in this way. What is the most effective strategy for, for countering terrorism? Is it through operations like drone strikes? Is it through cutting down the money, the funding for these groups? How do you see it? Well, it's got to be a combination of both. I mean, counterterrorism is never about defeating the enemy. It's about encumbering the enemy, finding lots of different ways Why to trip them up. Why can't it be about up. defeating the enemy? Well, it's very hard to. I can't remember the last time we truly uh, destroyed or decimated uh, uh, you know, a, a terrorist organization. I think there was talk about it last year or the year before, but we, didn't, we never quite got there. And it's just hard. These are amorphous enemies. And so you've got to throw everything that you can, counterterrorism, finance, drones, the whole works. One big thing out of your testimony I just wanted to underscore for our viewers today is that you found, and, and you, by the way, had worked with the Treasury Department before, so you have a background in this. You found that despite everything we see going on in Syria and Yemen and, and the like, that some of our our allies in the Middle East continue their financing of these terror groups despite all the operation and the public outrage about them. That's right. You know, we're seeing countries like Kuwait and Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey is a new one, which is very troubling. Uh, these are countries that, of course, purport to be American allies, but they're allowing a, a huge amount of terror finance activity to take place on their soil. And in some cases, we, we believe they may be actually helping to facilitate it. Interesting. Jonathan, always great to have you on the program. Pleasure. Thank you very much. John?